The Bleach anime fixed another huge Kubo problem. Squad Zero is officially redeemed. But also, we got an amazing finale that brightens the future of Bleach in more than one way. This finale is one for the ages. Shirisaku brought his A-game, the directors, storyboarders, and animators did an amazing job, and at the end of the review, I got a rant that you guys need to hear. So, it's gonna be a long ride, get comfortable, but most of all, enjoy. And if you do enjoy, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. It'll help the channel greatly. This episode starts off with the introduction of Yushiro Shihoen, the new clan leader of the Shihoen clan, along with the remain advisors, who have come to land a hand to Shinigami. We then switch to the more important battle location, the Royal Palace. Now, Nimaya faces off against Buryu and Hasfroth, determined to kill the successor to Yuha, whichever of the two it manages to be. Jigram unsheaths his sword, and then, using the good fortune that allowed the Zero Squad to escape fighting Yuha, he turns it into bad fortune that starts to collapse the Cage of Life. Hikifune leaves to try and mitigate the effects that Jigram is having on the Cage of Life, and Kirinji follows up by attacking with a water ability that separates Jigram and Ishida leaving Ishida to face off against Senjumaru while Jugram battles Kirinji. Here, we get a small battle between Uryu and Senjumaru, who fights using the arms on her back. Uryu overlays his blute over his hands and uses it to parry her attacks before attacking with a flurry of arrows of his own. Senjumaru parries it rather easily, and meanwhile, Kirinji engages in a beautifully animated sequence against Jugram, who pulls out his sword and shield to protect himself, but he's overpowered by Kirinji, who takes his shield and cuts him down, defeating him. Being that the two remaining Quincy are fighting Zero Squad members, Nimaya heads off to just chill out somewhere when he's impacted by Askin's death dealing ability. The death dealing shrift is a power that allows Askin to lower the lethal dose of any substance. In other words, he made Nimaya's own blood lethal to his body and caused Nimaya to be poisoned by his own body. He wisely calls for Kirinji, who is now available, being that he just beat Hasfoth, and Kirinji uses his red hot spring water to replace Nimaya's old blood with a new one given him the opening he needed to cut down Askin. Around the same time, Ryu is battling Senjumaru and fires a licked Regen attack which she blocks with her umbrella before firing back at him knocking him out of the fight. And so right off the bat, Squad Zero re-establishes itself as an amazing force to be reckoned with. And now, with the non yuha Quincy taken care of, they look to Ichibei to complete his battle against Yuha to end the entire war so far. Now to shift over to Ichibe and Yuha's battle for just a little bit, Ichibe's brush does not cut flesh, it cuts names. And after Yuha blocked his brush with his arms, he loses half the power of his arms and his movements become very labored. This allows Ichibe to knock Yuha back onto the platform as Ichibe looms hellishly over him. We then come back to the Serete and in a very dark scene, Giselle is sucking the blood out of Bambietta and crushes her head when Bambietta asks her to stop. It was an extremely gory scene, and the choice to have Giselle's eyes light up as they did was great. She's approached by Lil Toto, who is trying to regroup after defeating and eating Pepe. They're having small talk, but it's obvious that they're nervous as to what fate awaits them now that they have been left behind by Yuha. In perfect timing, and in what is probably, I don't know, top three moments of Bleach all time, Yuha activates his Osh Valen and takes the powers of all the Quincy below before bestowing that to the Quincy in the Royal Palace. Now this scene, this scene was just amazing. The color palette of the scene completely changes to a dark blue as Yuha holds something that looks like a black hole in the palm of his hands, and he starts to chant. The orb-like effect then starts to absorb Reishi, and then it shoots out, enveloping the entire sky. All the Quincy below begin to get struck by blinding flashes of light, and the devastation that it caused raged across the entire battlefield. It felt like the end of the world. The storyboarding of these scenes increased the sense of danger we all felt, and it created such an emotionally thrilling sequence of events. Just amazing stuff. Yuha then amasses that energy in the sky to create some kind of spirit bomb structure, and then it explodes, raining down pure, unadulterated Quincy energy over the remaining Sternator, who awaken, get back to their feet with increased power, and stand ready to fight again. What a magnificent sight. In the post credit scene of this episode, we see Jushiro and Shinsui meet up and the foreshadowing for what is to come is already beginning. Jushiro has a date with fate and Shinsui has a date with the devil. In the very next episode, Yuha faces off against Ichibei with his new power and remarks that everything in the world exists for his taking, with the Soul King not being an exception. Ichibei's face in this moment is very hilarious because he looks so unconcerned and unamused. It's just great, I love it. 
But as great as those things are, and it is, this episode is where Squad Zero's stock just explodes through the roof. The implications of this are massive, and we're gonna talk about it here, believe me. Lilibaru immediately pierces Nimaya with his gun, and Nimaya can't even react in time. When Nimaya makes the prediction that the Osvalian increased the power of the Quincy, Lily corrects him by saying, one, this isn't new power. This is my original power that I did not get to use before, and two, I did not pierce you with a bullet. Anything in between my gun and my target is pierced without regard for blocking. You cannot block Lily's attack. You have to dodge. Lily's shot goes through the weapons of both Kirinji and Hikifune and pierces Nimaya in his chest. But where the manga might have ended things, the anime took it upon itself to include completely new and unique content to further build on this battle of heaven. Kirinji takes out his Kinpika sword, which shines very brightly and creates an opening for the Zero Squad who disperse. Then Jumaru grabs Nimaya and jumps into the air, and then, using her multiple arms, she grabs this dough-like substance and places it over his two injuries, one over his shoulder and the other in his midsection. She then weaves his wounds together and completely regenerates the flash, restoring him to full health, and he immediately re-enters the battle. They restate that they are stronger than the entire Gotei 13 put together, and boy are they about to prove it. Ikifune creates another wood barrier and sections each Zero member into a one-on-one -on -one battle against the Royal Guard. And we're gonna go through them all, don't you worry. So first off, Gerard and Senjimaru square off. He stabs her through the heart before realizing that it's a woven marionette. The real Senjimaru appears behind him and knocks him to the ground before weaving him to the floor, immobilizing him. In the other battles, Ikifuna keeps launching plant-based attacks at Pernita, who just warps them out of existence. She manages to overpower and envelop him in wood and immobilizes him for a while. Meanwhile, Denji is blitzing Askin with his speed, and Askin, in a very knock Lavar fashion, decides to run for it. He runs away, and Kirinji chases after him, but it's obvious that Kirinji hasn't beat in a contest of speed. And finally, Nimaya vs. Lele is somewhat locked into a stalemate. Lele keeps attacking, but Nimaya is dodging well enough to avoid being pierced. The battle then switches over to Yuha vs. Ichibe, who attacks with an ability he calls Hyaporankan. Yuha then counters with a Quincy defensive technique called Blutvene auf Heiben. The Blut attack does parry Ichibe's Hyaporankan, but Ichibe takes it to a completely new level, using Secret Haro number 3, Tepusatsu, which creates a dragon-like face that absorbs Yuha's attacks, making him vulnerable. Ichibe goes for a choke, and once he makes contact with Yuha, his arm is overcome by the Quincy's blute extending towards his face, but he muscles through and almost crushes Yuha's neck. This prompts Ichibe into activating his Shika, called Ichimonji. Ichimonji splashes ink over Yuha's sword and takes away the name of his sword, removing its power as well. Meanwhile, back at the battle between the Royal Guard and Squad Zero, Senjumaru tries to pierce Gerard's heart and realizes that she can't. It's foreshadowing for the reveal that is bound to happen. Gerard is born from the heart of the Soul King. He breaks through his shackles and punches her to the ground before stomping on her face. As that is proceeding, Brunita breaks out of his enchainment and forces Hikifune to use up a lot of her spiritual pressure, which makes her lose weight. Askin manages to lure Kirinji into a false sense of confidence and nails him with a point-blank error attack. And finally, Lily capitalizes on Nimaya's bet that he wouldn't shoot him if it meant shooting Yuha as well and pierces him taking him down for the count. The trick here is that Lele's attack will only pierce what he considers to be the target. But not even just that, Lele actually taps into his intangibility powers for a split second here, something that is foreshadowing his later abilities in the coming course. Great stuff overall. Yuha then decides to take each base powers for himself, which is a huge deal because not only did he say that he could, he actually did. Yuha has the ability to take the power of other people, Quincy or otherwise, he can literally do that. Insane. He robs Ichibe of his black power and then fires an attack back at Ichibe, putting the Shinigami on the back foot. All the Zero Squad members are thrown up together as the Royal Guard looms over them. Nimaya then gets up to his feet and orders the others to do the same. He then reiterates that they will now show the Quincy the true power of the Royal Guard. As it were, Neither of them have actually used the full power of even one Royal Guard member. 
But now, they're ready to. Nimaya points his blade at Senjumaru and selects her to be the one to defeat them. His reasonings make sense, in my opinion. She has taken the least amount of damage, and she herself had abilities that were suited for fighting against multiple opponents. I would have loved for Nimaya to do it himself, but he was badly injured, and he is a bad match for multiple opponents off this level. Senjumaru walks forward, and the other three get on their knees and slit their throats, killing themselves. The Royal Guard are shocked to see this and inquire as to what is going on. And this is where Kubo just starts to elevate the source material onto a whole new level. Get this. Each single squad, as you remember, is so strong that if they were to release even a little bit of their real power, heaven and earth of all three realms would shake. In order to keep things safe and balanced, they bound their lives together in what they call a blood oath, restricting their ability to release their full power. And the only way one person can release their full strength is if the other three die. Ichibe is the only one not afflicted by this restriction. I like this decision for two main reasons. Number one, it proves that the Zero Squad are as powerful as they say they are. If one person's Ryatsu alone can shake heaven and earth in all three worlds, yeah, you're as powerful as you say you are. And if you have five of those dudes on one squad, yeah, you're stronger than all of the Gotei put together. Secondly, it doesn't matter what medium it is, and it doesn't matter what anime this is, I am always going to be a fan of this concept called the Law of Equivalence Exchange. If you want to get something of a certain level, you have to be willing to give something of equal level in return. What that means, in the terms I'm describing here, is that it's always good when there are prices to pay for power. In order to keep the peace and stability in all three worlds of Bleach, Squad Zero's power was sealed, and in order to release the full power of one person, three others have to die. That is an insane restriction, but it works because the stakes are that freakishly high. But let's talk a second about the Blood Oath and how Kubo represented it. Kubo portrays this entire sequence beautifully by showing a dark lit room with four candles sitting on some kind of pedestal. Behind each candle is a symbol that represents each of the four squad members, and each symbol points toward a set quadrant. So imagine a circle cut into four parts. You have four quadrants, one, two, three, four. Each quadrant represents a specific zero guard. When the other three kill themselves, their respective candles go out and the big symbol in the back, which represents them as a whole, fades away, leaving the only one who's left alive. The Maya symbol looks like a bunch of Zonpak toes shooting out from one sword. Chi's symbol looks like a water symbol, but just with a pompadour. Senjumaru's symbol is a string with a needle at the end, and Hikifune's symbol is a bunch of mod silk kanbakus. Candles of Kirinji, Owetsu, and Hikifune fade, leaving only Senjumaru who then powers up. Now, this part is difficult to describe, but I'll do my best here. She initiates her Bankai, and somehow, she says it better than Unohana did, which is insane. But she activates her Bankai, and it's almost like some kind of reality marble slash domain expansion type thing. Again, I know that Bleach came before domain expansion. I'm just using this as a way to describe what it is. A weaving loom erects from the ground and her fig arms extend outwardly, with each hand making a symbol with its fingers. The loom constructs itself, with wheels connecting and everything in between, and a red thread manifests, flowing all the way down to the floor as curtains and carpets fall from the sides of this dimension. Different smaller looms also appear and red threads extend from it onto the main threads and she almost creates a reality. She traps them within a dimension almost. The moment her Bankai activates, everything starts to shake. So society is shaking and the human world is also shaking. They don't show Wekumundo, but we know that it would be too. She then starts to casually strut through this room she's made, speaking ominously. She traps each of the Royal Guard in a separate room and takes them down one by one. The cool thing about this is that the way they're taken down as someone who's read the manga is foreshadowing a future event. And that is cool. We're going to run through each and every single one of them, so spoilers if you guys don't want to be spoiled. Although it's probably too late, I probably should have said that earlier, I apologize. Layla gets trapped in somewhat of a kaleidoscope reality, and if you know how he's taken out in the manga, He's intangible and cannot be destroyed by tangible objects. However, he can be hurt by his own attacks if you can reflect it back at him. In the end, his own ability is reflected back at him using an eight mirror sword. And you can see here in this shot, there are eight sides. I don't think Senjimari can see the future. It's just Kubo foreshadowing future events. 
Lilibaro sees who he believes to be the enemy and fires at them, but he himself ends up being shot and he falls down to the ground, defeated. Askin is put into a room where spikes erupt from the ground, and three paper figurine-like creatures fall over him, trapping him and killing him. Now in this case, this is somewhat of a reach, but his eventual fight was against Kisuke, Yoruichi, and Grimjow, and his gift ball deluxe became his tomb, so you could look at it that way if you want. Pernita, the arm of progress, is caught in the bowels of black sand, getting lost to the sands of time, and Gerard is caught in a room filled with blue curtains and he's frozen to death, an homage to the eventual battle he will have with mature Toshiro Hitsugaya. He's caught in a red room, and the carpets that are in that room have trees on them that are burnt down, just like he and Basby's homes were burnt down by Yuha. He's then overrun by the flames as he tries to flee from it, which is indicative of his coming conflict with Basby, a user of fire. And then for Uryu, he's caught in a room with the curtains detailing somewhat of a starry night sky, with the Star of the Quincy absorbing the other stars onto himself, representing his most traumatic experience, the loss of his mother as a result of Yuha's Ashvalen. Do you see the extent of Kubology required to break this down? <laughs> it's magnificent work by Kubo. Magnificent. Senjumaru then binds off and releases the cloths from the loom, and when she does so, all the royal guard are now cloths. Curtains, if you will. And they now decorate this room of hers filled with other curtains of all kinds. That entire sequence is nuts, insane, monumental. Where do I even begin? I have no idea, but we'll talk about it in a second. To go back to Yuha vs Ichibe, Yuha believes that he has defeated Ichibe when Ichibe takes his power back and unleashes his Bankai, or as he calls it, Shinuchi Shirafude Ichimonji, which is the first evolved Zanpakuto, or as we call it now, Bankai. Ishikai can take away the name and power of anything it touches, and his Bankai can bestow a name onto anything he's touched with his Shikai, giving it a new existence. He calls Yuha the Black Ant, he stomps on him, sends him tumbling down below, and crushes him with his palms, seemingly defeated the Quincy King once and for all. And that is where the episode and season end. Okay, so there's a lot to talk about here, obviously, but let's focus on the main point I want to make in this video. Squad Zero is redeemed. That's what I said. How, why, and at what cost? Let's talk about that. From my perspective, here's the deal. When Kubo introduced Squad Zero, he introduced them with a phrase. They only have five members but all five members are stronger than all of the GOATS A13 put together. That is a wildly confident phrase. That is a huge deal. And so, when they were defeated by Yuha's royal guard without putting up enough of a fight, it felt cheap and quite frankly, no one, if they were making the Bleach Top 10, really would reserve four spots for the non Ichibe royal guard. They just wouldn't. However, after today's episode, there is an argument to be made that if you're making the Bleach Top 10 characters in terms of power, you gotta leave five spots the five royal guard. We could not say that before, or at least it wasn't a foregone conclusion. Whereas now, there's an argument. But interestingly, the entire situation is not as simple as you may have thought. The Zero Squad went up against Yuha Shutstaffel. In that situation, do you make the royal guard look good by beating the Quincy, or do you make the Quincy look good by defeating the royal guard? One is going to negatively affect the other. It's either the Shutstaffel don't come off as the most dominant force in Bleach history, or the Zero Squad prove that they are stronger than all of the Gotei put together. It's one or the other. Ubo and the Bleach team chose to focus, at least for now, on Squad Zero, and I have to agree that this was probably the best choice. Their power is so restricted that they cannot go all out without the other three being killed. And even then, that one person who is left is unleashing a devastating amount of energy onto all the worlds. What this does is that it builds Squad Zero to a point where whoever does end up beating Senjumaru, and someone has to, whoever it is, whoever it is that beats her will come off looking extremely powerful. So, so powerful. And you know, who's your bet on? Does Uryu do it with his antithesis? Does Yuha do it after defeating Ichibe? Or are the shoots off while breaking out on their own? Who knows? But it's good to see how competent Squad Zero are. It's good to see how battle ready, experienced, and team oriented they are. They work in perfect unison with each other. It's the best teamwork we've seen from any Bleach organization so far. And just in case you were wondering, the reason they're so open to killing themselves is because so long as Ichibe remains alive, he can resurrect them. Their life force is merged with the soul of the spirit palace itself and they will live forever, so long as the one in Ichibe remains alive. 
Also, for the record, I've seen people talk about Aizen invading the royal palace to fight by himself against these five, and it's like, they know about Kyokosui Getsu, because if the captains down below know about Kyokosui Getsu, so do the royal guard. And if the royal guard knows about Aizen's abilities to begin with, could they figure out a way to counter him? Could they fight with their eyes closed and still be badass as hell or something? Like, you know, there, there are ways that maybe they could work around it, but would they beat Aizen if Aizen invaded the royal palace? I'm not going to answer that. I'll let you answer that in the comment section down below for the question of the day. But overall, these happenings just prove that Core 3 and 4, where we're going next, are uncharted territory. There has never been a more likely situation for Ichigo's Bankai to actually be revealed than right now in this current age of Bleach. There's never been a better time for you to get more scenes of Aizen fighting against Yuha, or maybe Aizen fighting against other characters than right now. There's never been a better time to see Gerard Valkyrie actually be defeated and not be defeated by way of the Osvalen than right now. There's never been a better time for us to get more depth into Kenpachi and Yachi's relationship than this current Age of Bleach. There's never been a better time for us to see Ishin and Ryukin actually enter the war and do something substantial than right now. And there's never been a better time for us to see Still Silver get introduced and built up and initiated the right way than this current age of Bleach. We are headed into uncharted territory. We don't know what and how some things are going to unfold. We don't know how it's going to happen. It's great and scary, but it's fun. It's so much fun. So overall, this finale, great episodes, both of them. Yuha's Australian was great, probably my favorite sequence in the entire Thousand Year Blood War so far. The art and animation in episode 25 especially was beautiful. Shirisakus' music was spectacular, and I had a blast. So look forward to more videos in the near future, but right now I'm going to hand this over to the rant side of the video, because there are some things that I need to get off my chest. Welcome to the rant section of the video. This is the part of the video where I do have to let Bleach fans know something that I think it's important to understand. There's a few things, I'm not trying to be too scripted here, but I will try to get my point across as best as I can. Number one, I want to make this point. Fans of this season have had a lot of issues with the cut content that's happened, whether it cut content for comedy, cut content for the etchy, cut content for whatever, whatever it is that they're talking about, or the pacing and how fast fights have moved. I'm not here to change how you feel about a certain choice that was made. That's your decision to make. I will not make that decision for you. What I am here to do is to give you a reason. This reason will not apply to every single scenario that you have an issue with, but in a general sense, it's important to understand. First of all, Bleach is slated for just over 50, 50 episodes, maybe 52 or 53, just over. The order for the amount of episodes is not by the random staff member you keep harassing on Twitter. It's not by the director, it's not by the producer. It comes from way above. That is the amount of episodes that they were slated for. That is what they have to work with. Put yourself in the shoes of the anime staff. Put yourself in the shoes of Kubo. Put yourself in the shoes of Taguchi and Hinamatsu, the scriptwriters. Put yourself in their shoes. You have been tasked with adapting Thousand Year Blood War. You've been given a set number of episodes. However, the fan base and you yourself know that there needs to be a lot of changes in the arc to make it as good as Kubo wants it. And Kubo needs time and space in order to add a ton of new content in terms of more characterization, longer fights, more world building, more lore, more character developments, and everything in between. Kubo and the team need space to do that, but you still have a set limit of episodes to work with. How do you work around that? What do you do? What you do is, you cut things that are worthy of being cut. You cut things that may not necessarily be important. You cut things that I consider manga filler. What manga filler is, is that Kuba might write a chapter and in the chapter, there may be two or three pages where even though it's Kubo who's writing it and by definition that makes it canon, even though that is the case, Kubo is still just filling pages because he might want to hit a certain cliffhanger at the end of the chapter and he still needs to make his page quota. So he'll fill up three pages saying things that have either already been said or he'll make the dialogues extremely long and redundant and unnecessary in some cases. Just because we're trying to do a manga adaptation, I mean, an anime adaptation of a manga, it doesn't mean we have to adapt all that stuff because clearly, even from Kubo's perspective, or even from someone who writes a lot, you'll read it and you'll know Kubo obviously just wanted to reach a certain point at the end of the chapter and put filler. I mean, it's his, it's, it's, it's canon because he's writing it, but it's technically manga filler in three or four pages because he wants to read a certain point for the end of the, uh, of the chapter. The anime doesn't have to adapt that and they don't adapt that. The comedy scenes, Kubo gave them free range. He said, 
I added comedy scenes in all of these places, but if you feel that it's unnecessary, if you feel that it will diminish the serious tone of the arc, take it out. And the etchy scenes, if you feel that the etchy scene is taking you out of the story, do it. He gave them the free range, except for one moment, which is the Orihime and Yoruichi scene, where Kubo actually pushed to have it, but the TV regulations didn't allow him to do so. If there's any example where Kubo's will was being perturbed, that would be an example of it. But in a general sense, if you're a fan who wants them to fix all the problems you claim Thousand Year Blood Rule had, exactly how are they supposed to do that if they did not create the space in order to work with. And that's what Core 1 and 2 have done. I will not fight against this opinion. We have blitzed through Core 1 and Core 2. They sped up. They went fast. And I mean really, really fast. By this point in the manga, we only have a few, I don't know, a hundred-ish chapters. I'm not sure if it's a hundred. But after Yuha's invasion of the Soul King's Palace, we're not very far from the end. And we have two whole cores to get through. They have succeeded, they succeeded in creating enough space in Core 3 and Core 4 for Kubo to finally go to work. And I find it very tiring when I see people complain about it as if they're doing it just because, instead of the fact that they're doing it because they absolutely need to. Because the choice of how many episodes they have didn't come from them, they didn't decide how many they needed, it comes from above. They just need to work with what they're given. Do you understand? And so, from now on, if you're here enjoying the Yuha Ichibe backstory, if you're here enjoying the entire subplot given to Ichigo and his Idoso Sandor training, for us to be able to implement that, something else has to go. That's how it works. And so, can we please stop pushing the narrative that they're just cutting stuff because they're, whether it be they're lazy or they don't want to do the work, it's for a reason. This doesn't have to make you feel better about feeling bad about something being cut. I don't think anyone can control that, but at least it's important that you have a reason. This is why they did it. So that at the very least, you understand. You may not agree, you understand. You feel me? The second thing that I think is important for Bleach fans to understand in reference to the Bleach anime is when we come to the subject of staffing. Now, I'm not an animation expert. I'm not an, I'm not an expert on the inner workings of the anime production. I try to research as best I can. I try to understand as best I can. And so if you're someone there who knows more than me and you find that the things I'm saying are wrong, I apologize ahead in advance. I am ready, willing, and able to learn if you will correct me. That is 100% the truth. But from what I have understood, I really wish Bleach fans would leave staff members alone because the fact of the matter is the more you learn, about the inner workings of the anime industry, you realize that the director that you're quote tweeting, it's not his fault. The animation director that you're quote tweeting, it's not his fault. The animator that you're quote tweeting, it's not his fault. It's not in their control. They don't have a say in that. I'll simplify the way it works for you like this. Tsudipiro wants to bring Bleach back, but they wanted to have a new feel. So. They say, well, Narika Abe is working on Boruto or whatever, but we want a new take. So they hit up Tominaga, the producer, and the producer says, I got a guy. His name is Tomohisa Taguchi. Let him do Bleach. I'm like, all right, cool. So they call up Taguchi. Hey, Taguchi, you just coming off. You're a really hot director coming right off Akudama Drive, which was a very well-received anime. He's like, hey, you want to do Bleach? Taguchi says, absolutely. I love Bleach. I want to do it. So they give it to him. Now, the, 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 Production committee, as it were, they come up with whatever money am, amount of money they're willing to invest in it and the slate of episodes, blah, blah, blah. That's that's up at the top. So they decide that, hey, you got this amount of episodes to work with. You have this amount of money to work with. Go make us the show. All right. So Taguchi sits down and he decides, OK, well, his staff members, who do you want? So he's like, I want that guy, I want that guy, I want that guy. Now, this is where it's important, because whenever people talk about the staffing problems in Bleach, this is where it's important to understand. Taguchi, the director, could want whoever he wants. He doesn't get them if the if the studio doesn't let him. You feel me? All he can do is say, give me Yoshihiro Kano. I worked with him on Akadama Drive. He's great. I want him. He tells his producer. The producer then goes to his higher-ups or whoever and says, we would like to sign Yoshihiro Kano slated for Bleach. Kano himself is cool with it, but we need, because again, you're not the one paying him. The studio is. If for whatever reason and for whatever reason, the studio gives you, gives you a reason and says, actually, no, we can't do it. That's a tough break for you. Find somebody else. So then if Taguchi is like, all right, cool. Give me Satoshi Sakai. It's like, okay, he can grab Sakai, but 
But then still, if the studio says, oh, sorry, we can't give you Sakai right now, there's nothing you can do. It's not, it's not an indictment on your ability to get people. It's an indictment on your studio's ability to give you what you asked for. You feel me? You understand? It's a reflection of the studio's own capabilities. It's not a reflection of they themselves. And so for people who say stuff like, oh, Norigi Abe would have done it better because Norigi Abe's team is better. Let me, it's important that you understand. Abe did have a great team for the original anime. He had a very, very good team. That team is gone. If he were now taking care of Thousand Year Blood War, he would have had to do the exact same thing. Hey, I want Kurita. I want um, Tanaka. I want Tokumaru. He would still have to go to his higher ups and say, give me that guy, that guy, and that guy. If for whatever reason they say no, there's nothing he can do. And as opposed to the other times when those cats were bleach, were Piro mainstays because they were in Piro, Piro has now fallen from grace. Those guys have left and gone to other studios. You, so they're not in house like they were before back in the day. Now they're gone. So you're actually asking them to give you guys outside the studio regulars which increases the chances that they'll say no <laughs> for whatever reason. Again, studios have different reasons, whether it be sometimes it's money, sometimes it's time, sometimes it's connections, sometimes it's nepotism. They want to give stuff to, I don't know the inner workings of that, but just from a general perspective, it really, really bothers me mentally when I see people go to the director of the, of the, or the AD or the animator with their issues about how something was adapted. It's not on them. <laughs> they can't do a thing. Takushi might have, he, for all we know, he was begging on his knees. It doesn't matter if his boss says, no, take this guy. He's the guy we have. It's either him or nothing. You understand? And so for Core 2 in particular, I do believe that Core 2 had probably a lot of production issues, although most anime in general have production issues. But I would imagine Core 2, they were actually struggling quite a bit because Piro was working on a Black Clover movie. And even that movie got delayed because they were having trouble. And so the fact that they were working on a movie basically means that if Taguchi went to Piro and said, hey, I would like, I'm just gonna say a random name. I would like Yoshiro Kano. And they said, oh, actually we need Kano for the movie. If, if, if we're gonna get anybody, we need him for the movie because the movie's priority because we're, we're getting a movie out next year or this year or whatever. And so any talent that's actually available, we're not give, gonna give them to you. We're gonna give it to the movie because the movie is the bigger investment because it's a movie. You feel me? So there's a lot of hoops that these directors have to jump through. A lot of hoops like Kano, he was there for Core 1. He has a prior commitment with A1 Studios, with solo leveling and Sword Art Online. The moment that was ready to go, he had to leave. And the same thing with a ton of these other animators. Because they're not pure all mainstays, they sometimes end up having to go somewhere else to do their other jobs, to do their other commitments. And there's nothing we can do because Piro is just in that bad of a position. So it's, it's, I'm very, very saddened because I feel like if Bleach fans only understood how close we are to the edge, if they understood how, I don't like to play this card, but if you understood how lucky we are, this is, it's still Studio Piro. They're still bad. Bleach is just somehow dodging the bullet right now by the skin of our teeth. We're just happening to get away with it. And Taguchi's um, vision for Bleach and his his access within the community is allowing us to get these people. Like Hiroyuki Mashita seems to really enjoy Taguchi and does stuff for him. And Taguchi and his whatever connections that he has, it's barely keeping us afloat. There was a ton of examples within the Piro structure where, for whatever reason, there are talented animators who are there in Piro. What are they doing? I do not know, but all we know is that they're not on Bleach. Why? It's not a Taguchi's call to make. It's not Tominaga's call to make. It comes from above. The system in of itself might be rigged in a certain way that doesn't benefit us. And it's just counterproductive if you ever go to Taguchi, Tominaga, Cindy, any of these, um, Sakai, any of these guys, and you take your issues to them as if they have control over it. They don't know what, they can't help you. They can't help themselves in that instance because they wish they could do better. They wish they had more, but they don't have more. That's the point. So look, look, I don't want to leave you with doom and gloom because it is a great day. Court 2 was having a lot of trouble, but even with those troubles, they delivered great stuff. Bleach is, I think, on my anime list, which is not the end-all be-all, but on my anime list, I do believe Bleach is the highest rated anime of the entire summer. 
of, of the entire season. Over Jujutsu Kaisen, which people love. Oh, Mappa, there's Mappa that, and Bleach is still topping that. Imagine that. Even this handicapped as it is, it's still topping that. Understand how close we are to the edge. How close the knife of execution is right above our heads and we're just hanging on by the skin of our teeth and by the work and sweat and tears of these people working on the anime. It's important to understand that. But positive spin on this, because there is a positive side. Positive spin on this is that Piro does not have a big production coming out in 2024. Oruto's ended. Naruto's ended. They have that four episode thing coming out, but whatever. Black Clover, as far as we know, isn't coming back in 2024. Piro does not have any other slate stuff. They have um, Kingdom, but Kingdom is being done by a sister studio, not by the main hero studio. They have nothing coming out, as far as I'm concerned. If I'm wrong, let me know. But they don't. Which means the only anime left to work on is Bleach. If we're lucky, and the powers that be give those resources to Bleach, things could be looking good. There's no way to tell. But until then, I will keep faith. And I will stand steadfast, hoping, knowing, the Bleach will get its just due. It needs to. If Pyrrha wants to get back where it needs to go, Bleach needs to succeed. And I hope they understand that. I really do. So, let me know what you think about this entire video. Please, let me know what you think in the comment section down below. Like, subscribe, share, and I'll see you in the next Rebirth video, which is probably going to be a Squad Zero video. But I'll see you then. Take care, guys. Bleach Thousand Blood World Core number 2 ends. Well, it ended yesterday. I'm sad that it's gone, but I'm looking forward to the future. Hopefully you guys will be there too. Follow me on the socials. You know how it is. This is your boy Rebirth. Signing out until the next video. Peace out.